first morning in Thailand, years back, I looked out my hotel window down to the street below, and I caught sight of a woman putting food in a monk's bowl. Now, I had seen movies of people putting food in monks' bowls, and it was presented as something that everybody does. It was a natural part of Thai culture. But actually seeing it happen was a very different experience. To me, it looked like a subversive act. It wasn't the case that everybody in the market, and it was a market street, it wasn't the case that everybody in the market was putting food in the monk's bowls. So it was just that one woman and that one monk. He came up, she came out with the food put in his bowl, they didn't say a word, and he slipped back into the crowd. It looked subversive. And it was. There is a subversive part of the Buddhist teachings. The monks stood for a totally different set of values from the market. Everybody in the market was buying and selling, and women were hawking their wares. And this is something different. It was a gift. What the monk wore, the way he looked, represented a very different set of values. And here was a woman in the market supporting that set of values. Later, as I got to know the forest tradition, I reinforced that sense of forest tradition being something separate from Thai culture, standing outside it a little bit. People go over to Thailand, and this is part of their introduction to Buddhism, they, or it's their introduction to Thai Buddhism. The forest tradition is part of the general picture of Thai culture. But especially back when I was with Ajahn Phuong, this was before the forest tradition became very popular, and the way he lived was something outside of the culture. His values are very different from any other Thai person I'd ever met. He represented the customs of the noble ones, which is a very different set of customs from the ones of ordinary society. And John Munn used to be attacked for the way he practiced. Again, we think of the forest tradition as being one integral part of Thai culture, but when John Munn started out, he was bucking a huge trend, a huge, a huge established tradition. The way he practiced the Tatanga practices, the way he wore his robes, the fact that he practiced out in the forest, was very different from the general tradition of Thai Buddhism. And people would attack him for it. They said, why don't you behave, behave the way other people do? Why, do you follow, why don't you follow our good Thai or Lao customs? And he would say, Thai customs, Lao customs, the customs of any country, these are the customs of people with defilements, customs of people who suffer, stuck in suffering. I want to follow the customs of the noble ones. Those are the ones who gain release from suffering, the way they behave, the way they, the standards that they set. Those are the ways I want to behave. Those are the standards I want to follow. And it was because he didn't let himself get sucked into the ordinary values of the culture. That was why he was able to succeed. He established something that stood apart. This principle is one of the things that keeps Thai culture healthy. The fact that it has room for a whole set of values that stand apart. And as people who practice the Dharma here in the West, we have to learn that same principle as well. We have to learn how to stand apart. Because as that passage we chanted just now says, the world is swept away. If we let ourselves get sucked into the world, we get swept away along with it. When aging comes, we get swept away with aging. Illness comes. Death comes. We get swept away with these things. We have to learn how to stand outside. So even though we're aware of the world, we participate in the world, but we're not in the world.
that's when we're safe. That's when we can be, we can be free from being swept away. One of the words in the Buddha's vocabulary, pawa, shows the connection between how we approach worlds outside and how we approach worlds in our mind. On the external level, we live in our power. We live in the level of being. It's the sensual level, the human level. On the internal level, we create worlds in our mind. You can see it happen. It's like a little bubble forming in your mind, or just in the general area of your body. There's a whole world in there. And you go into it and suddenly you find that it's not a bubble in your body. You're in the bubble now. And it can take you. It can float off in different directions, like a kite with its string cut. It can float off in different directions and come down who knows where. And if you let yourself get sucked into that bubble, you're in for trouble. As a meditator, you have to learn how to stand outside to see the process of the bubble forming. And then you can notice whether it's something worth going with or not. Because some of our thoughts really are worthwhile. Things we have to do, things we have to say, things we have to plan about. But a lot of them are just random bubbles. And some of them are actually harmful. And for the most part, people just let them get sucked into whatever comes up, attracts their attention. They go with it. without asking where it's going to go. It's like getting onto a train without asking where the train is going to go. Just jump on the train and go wherever it takes you. That kind of living is dangerous. And yet that's the way most of us live. We let ourselves get sucked into these worlds wherever they take us. They get swept away. We find that they, we have nothing of our own in there. They give us no shelter, and they're never satisfactory. Some of them are useful, but in and of themselves they don't provide any real satisfaction. So we have to develop strong powers of mindfulness and concentration to withstand this tendency of going into these worlds. Mindfulness is actually composed of two things, mindfulness and alertness. Mindfulness is the ability to keep something in mind. You establish a frame of reference, the body, in and of itself. In other words, not the body as it relates to the world, but just the body in and of itself, as you experience it right here on its own terms. Or feelings in and of themselves, simply the arising of a feeling that's passing away. Mind states, mental qualities. You choose a frame of reference and you stay there. These are the topics of concentration. As I said this morning, the Buddha didn't draw a clear line between mindfulness practice and concentration practice. They shade into each other. The four foundations of mindfulness, or the four establishings of mindfulness, are the themes of concentration. And with the factors that develop mindfulness, mindfulness and alertness. Alertness is knowing what you're doing, knowing what the results of what you're doing, coupled with ardency, the ability to really stick with it, to put effort into the practice, the effort to be sensitive, the effort to be focused. When these are all working together, they slide very naturally into concentration practice. The Buddha often talks about how the four foundations of mindfulness lead naturally into the seven factors for awakening. Which are the factors of concentration? Mindfulness, analysis of qualities, rapture, persistence, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Mindfulness practice is supposed to lead there. When you get to the fourth jhana, you've got purity of mindfulness. That's the only place where mindfulness is really pure. And at the same time, the mind is really solid. It's firmly in its reference, frame of reference, the whole body. 
as a whole, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes. With the breath still and the mind at equanimity. This is the frame of reference where you can see these bubbles of little worlds coming up in the mind and not necessarily have to get sucked into them. It's like driving past a drive-in theater. You have your choice. As you drive past, you look at the screen and you suddenly realize that's, that's Red Butler, that's Scarlett O'Hara, and you get sucked into the story and you go on with the wind. Or you can see it simply as colors. Flashes of light flashing on the screen, this, that, the other thing. Looking at it the first way is dangerous. You can drive off the road. Looking at it the second way, you see this is all that is. It's just flashes of color. And yet people can cry and laugh and get all excited by these flashes of color. It gives you a sense of sangwega, a sense of dispassion. And that's safe. When, so when your foundation is really solid, mindful, alert, ardent, fully aware of the body, with mindfulness Im immersed in the body, you can stand outside those worlds. In the same way, you can stand outside the world outside. You've got a place where you can observe what's going on. You can watch the values of society. And you can ask yourself, do I really want to go there? Do I really want to get sucked into that thought world? Then you can look at society as a whole and see how futile it is. All the clamoring, all the time spent in getting and spending. A society that conspires to put people who are blatantly selfish, filled with greed, anger, and delusion, put them in power, praise them. Is this a society you really want to get sucked into? And step back even further, the whole human condition. Is this something you really want to be sucked into? Now, it may seem heartless to step outside this way, but it's not. And the Buddha stepped outside, but he had the compassion to help other people get out as well. It's not that he just turned his back on the world and ran away. There's a famous retelling of the Buddha's story in Thai. And a major part of the story is devoted to how the Buddha, after his awakening, went back home, taught the Dhamma to the rest of his family, and many of them became arahants. A lot of people focus on how horrible it was that Prince Siddhartha left his wife, left his son. But they forget to notice that he came back and taught his wife to be an arahant raised his son. When the son became mature and when he reached adulthood, he was an arahant as well. And very few fathers can do that for their family. So having this place in the mind where you really are solid, it puts you in a safe position, but also puts you in a position of strength. And you can use that strength both to help yourself and to help other people. Like the woman in the market, you have one foot in both worlds. Or to be more precise, you've got both feet outside the world, but you can reach in when you need to and offer another perspective. Having this outside perspective helps you keep your mental health and other people who pick up on it, they gain a measure of health as well.
So this subversive act that we're doing here, stepping outside of the world, it's not the sort of subversive act that destroys the world, like anarchism or for terrorism. It's actually an act of kindness. After all, the Buddha was often compared to a doctor. He healed the illnesses of the world, and the, way, the reason he was able to heal them was because he was able to step outside them, gain release from them, and then show the way to other people. So the practices we have here of meditating, learning how to step outside our thought worlds by creating a good foundation for the mind. This principle works with the world outside as well. We can step outside of that by staying with the same foundation, having respect for it, maintaining it, sustaining it, making it the place where we take our stand, so that when the worlds get swept away, we're not swept away along with them. And we're not part of the confusion that gets other people swept away as well. That right there is a real gift.